So can you read those to me again from your Instagram account, the comments, and what was the original post? My post was, in what ways have you felt misunderstood by a therapist? And I pulled the ones that people had the strongest reaction to. Okay. One, I've had several who have absolutely no idea what true narcissistic abuse actually is and what true complex PTSD is and how the two present in a patient. It's mind blowing actually. I told him about the abuse and he said he sees the love my abuser has for me and I should give him positive affirmations every day. I fired him. Thank goodness. Good, good the current him. one is good, but prior to this, every therapist wanted to define me. Instead of understanding me, they wanted to put me in categories. Not a therapist, but my psychiatrist told me that my depression didn't really meet the standards for what depression is. Insinuated that it wasn't really as bad as I was telling him it was. We'll come mm -hmm. back to that. I confided mm -hmm. in a therapist about my troubles with a friend of me, but the therapist took the friend of me on as a client, even rescheduled my appointments to accommodate the friend of me and had the nerve to suggest a paired session to salvage our friendship. I hate it when they say, you have choices. How do you think you can act differently next time? Abusive environments don't allow to act differently. It causes further abuse if you act differently next time. She kept telling me how strong I am, and I guess meant it as a compliment. And I'm like, Bestie, that's the problem. I don't want to be strong to deal with everybody else's problems. <laughs> when my first therapist asked if she could pray with me in sessions, I bounced. Well, let's clarify, too, that a lot of these people are giving this insight as an aftermath in the moment. Rarely does someone know that that's a betrayal and that they're being treated in such an unprofessional manner. If you're vulnerable and you're yeah. walking into to therapy thinking, I need help, that therapist s kind of sets the bar of what normal is. And so right. it's empowering when you see someone say, I fired them or I knew this was wrong and I walked away. A lot of times right, you right. don't know. And, and, and therapy becomes a new traumatic event. That was so wise because that's very true you know you know in a way where when i think about people when they hit bottom or something really changes and they have to either go back to therapy or find a therapist there's a lot of rigmarole and angst just to kind of make that happen you know waiting for the appointment and then the you know just trying to wait for somebody to call you back and you know it's a lot of shooting in the dark it's sort of like what you just said was so <coughs> excuse me what you just said was so bright because I don't think we really kind of pay attention to how much power and authority kind of a, even the therapists aren't really kind of privy to this about how much power the therapists kind of have. So it's like when you're sitting there and you're taking a risk and being vulnerable or talking about your story and um, you get the responses that you just sort of late, like sort of that there's a lot of blame. There's a lot of weird boundary stuff. There's a lot of, I'm, I'm gonna, can we pray together? Like, where are we? I think if I putting myself in sort of the, the person's shoes, I'm going to dissociate a little bit. I'm going to, you know, like where I'm not going to know immediately. I mean, I probably would now as a therapist, but years ago, I wouldn't have known immediately that it, it, that this was profoundly wrong. So it's sort of like, you know, you may not, you may not realize till years later or weeks later, or you, you get some insight or you read it, read about like, you just don't, you just know, you might not feel good, but, I think childhood trauma is so much around the abuse of perception. So when we get to the therapist or the healer or whatever, we, all of us, I think, struggle with reclaiming a sense of judging someone's character or figuring out what works for us or even just sort of saying like, what's right and wrong, you know? But also in some of those cases, people are gonna know if, you know, like if, if you, if you if you go to a therapist and they're sort of saying let's pray together for your mom some people are going to know that they've they've now taken a turn into the land of bad shit and you know like <laughs> but what you said was so bright thank you i think that it's dismissed how if someone goes to a therapist and that therapist models any type of behavior that their abuser has modeled or a dysfunctional environment has modeled the client doesn't know that that's what's happening 
I say this often, it's not a red flag if it's all you've ever known. We talk about red flags of, yeah, didn't you yeah. see the red flags, didn't you see the red flags? And it's just like, well, it's not a red flag if that's their norm. You can't expect someone who grows up right. in a in env- dysfunctional environment where everything in their life is about survival. And they mm-hmm. build this exterior shell of this is how I exist. There's no living in it. There's no thriving in it. It's truly saying this is how I exist. This is what helps me float to get by and not get this wound, this wound, this wound. So when they're finally reaching out for help, the hope is that you pull them out of that environment. If you speak to them in a right. way that mirrors what they've they've always known, it's not the responsibility of the client to know that and name that. Mm-hmm. They're, in, they're in a very vulnerable place. And I think that that's what's tragic is how often we don't realize, like in the therapy community, there are a lot of hidden people that their intent in becoming therapists is to have control and power of, over other people. Their intent yes. is to say, I am not going to do my own work. I will never have an honest conversation. My intent is to control yep. and have access to vulnerable people. Right. Um, not trying to demonize therapists, but there is a lot of that. I worry for my field. My biggest thing, just really relevant to what you just said, is um, therapist never ever being a client, but they go into the work. You know, some people, and it's not. It's it's kind of it's actually kind of a a common thing. Some people go into psychology or whatever to try to fix themselves or figure themselves out without doing the vulnerability work with, with another therapist. But it's all, um, I, I really have a lot of mixed feelings about, <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell people a good therapist is like a good mechanic. You trust them. They have your best interests. They know how to fix things. I really want to underline and highlight that, put that in caps. They know how to fix things. Um, but there's just a lot of other people out there that like what you said in those Instagram comments that they they have the degree, but they have terrible boundaries. You know, there's a lot of also, too, in those comments, I heard a lot of naming without helping. Do you know what I mean? Like where someone Good gets part. a degree and does that and they're just they're just kind of like, well, yeah, you know, you might sounds like to me it's hard to say, but, you know, like you might sort of be experiencing like being a quiet borderline. We'll, we'll see you next week. Do you know what I mean? Like, good luck with that. You know what I mean? There's really no, um, there's really no model of change. There's really no sort of theoretical kind of a thing. Like there's just sort of, there's a, I really want the listener to know there's a really big difference between general talk therapy and sort of good therapist and mediocre therapist and just flat out bad therapist, you know? Um, and but I find that there's just a lot of people not having a model to work with. It's one issue. The other issue being like they maybe haven't done their own childhood trauma work, you know, or their own family system work or whatever. Not that I'm not saying that that's everybody has to, but it's like what you said in a very bright way when you were sort of saying you go there expecting someone to know what the abusive family system is about and to know how that affects someone's conditioning when instead it's just kind of like handouts about depression you know what i mean and it's just there's no kind of conversation there the the one that um where the person said the therapist said that my depression doesn't really meet the standard of what depression is i think that is just a moment where that covers a broad spectrum of conversations that one should never take place to ever have someone mm-hmm. say, you know, the way that you're feeling doesn't really match what the DSM five says or whatever training I've had. Therefore you need to figure out something else. Um, please pay me, have a good week. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not, it's being able to be curious enough to say when this person comes into this space with me, it is my responsibility to hold their pain. If I'm going by a checklist and I'm trying to take each person and put them through the same machine that I know and understand about people without the idea of of how trauma impacts every person differently. Every single person. You and I could go to the same exact therapist and both need two totally different things. If that person can't adapt and have the curiosity to say, 
how do I show up for Patrick in this space so that when Patrick leaves, there's a clear understanding of what his mind and body is carrying and what the, the possible options are and what our next step is for him to find relief and peace. That's the bare minimum, and that's right. not happening in so many therapeutic relationships. And it's tragic. It's really tragic. Right. Yep, absolutely. And for the listener, you know, if I have a client that tells me that, you know, they do therapy with their, and again, I'm not trying to demonize anybody. I don't want this to be a global conversation that it's all bad. I would say it's pretty bad, but it's not all bad, you know. Um, if someone comes in and tells me that they're, they, see their, they see a psychiatrist once every two months and they kind of talk about things and do a little bit of therapy, I really, what, what I know of or what my assumption is of how usually it goes is it's usually like a 20 minute appointment once every two months or something like that, two or three months, just to sort of see how things are going with the antidepressant. And it's very transactional, 15 minutes. Some psychiatrists do sort of spend a 45 minute hour and do the med stuff and do a little bit of therapy and that, that's all fine and good too. But um, if I'm working with a client who sees a psychiatrist, it's sort of like I, I kind of want them to be in biweekly or weekly therapy. If they're coming in for childhood trauma and they're starting to do that process and that kind of a thing. But why I say all that is kind of most people don't quite get, and it's because it's really confusing, it's not to their fault, they don't really get the breakdown between a psychologist who's a doctor who doesn't prescribe, a psychiatrist where they're, they're, they're prescribing medications to address mental health issues, and then a whole bunch of like letter soup salad of a whole bunch of counselors, and I'm an MSW, I have a master's in social work, I have a licensed independent clinical social work license to practice clinical therapy and to do social advocacy and stuff like that, you know? And then there's LMHEs, licensed mental health counselor. So there's this all array of things. And the breakdown of that is kind of hard to kind of get, get down, you know what I mean? And then then now we there's a lot of people, like sort of, I think it's a good thing of, of both people doing therapist and coaching to address kind of different issues. So it's confusing out there, do you know what I mean? And it's just, and impossible to navigate. It's impossible if you're entering into that world. Um, I wrote the ebook, the free ebook, A Survivor's Guide to Trauma Recovery, to explain this is what therapy is, this is what psych psychiatric care, this is psychological, this is trauma informed oh, right. care, because all of mm -hmm. these things are different, and, and it's hard to know what you what you need. The part yep. that really that I struggle with so much is that within the field of mental health care the trauma-informed piece is so diluted and people are yeah. saying i work with people with trauma and yet they don't have any type of trauma modality and i think that that's one of the things mm -hmm. that really concerns me is if if you are walking someone through their traumatic experiences every time you have a client that is walking you through a memory of something that happened to them 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago from childhood. That memory mm -hmm. has shaped so much of their life. And in that space, you have to give them tools, a process where right. when they remember that memory and they go to that place, their body finds relief, their mind finds peace. And so what happens mm -hmm. a lot of times in talk therapy, I'm not bashing talk therapy, it's important, the value of talk therapy and, and laying mm -hmm. a foundation before practicing any type of modality is, is obviously very important. But there's such a disconnect with what trauma-informed means and when someone's sitting in front mm -hmm. of you and right. they're having all of these memories come to their surface, their mind and body is paying for that in real time. Right. In that moment, it is your responsibility to create an environment where they feel empowered and safe. That's not a time to do a checklist or a diagnosis or a guess. It's that, that, that curiosity and compassion piece to be able to say, there has mm -hmm. to be an equal flow where this person feels really safe in my presence and they know that in this moment, I'm not gonna choose a hierarchy of, well, as the therapist, but I'm going to recognize right now their mind and body is experiencing things 
right. that they don't know what to do with because of pain from a long time ago. How do I walk them towards safety? Yes. And so many thoughts going through my head about what you just said, because it's it, that is for me the main crux of a couple things is the, the treatment for childhood trauma is there's such a deficit of it out there. Do you know what I mean? Like a good therapist, it's su- what I'm trying to say is it's super rare to find a childhood trauma therapist. And that's, I'm making that up. There's not like a, you don't go and just get a certain license appendage right. for something that makes you, a, you know, I call myself a childhood trauma specialist because I don't really know what else to call myself. Right. That I'm not just a licensed independent clinical social worker, but it's not like I, you know, got a state certificate in that. Do you know what I mean? I'm just kind of saying what I specialize in. Um, it'd be cool if there was, but so many thoughts of, so there's, the service is barely in existence, I think. You know, we're just sort of starting. My mentor and I were training people, but as you were talking, I was thinking about I, how much, when I was about 19 years old, I hit the lottery and my first therapist was a childhood trauma therapist. When we sat down, I called her, told her what was going on, and she was sort of say, well, this is sort of what I do. We talk about these families or whatever. And for some reason, I was kind of a little bit open to that. I wasn't prepared, I wasn't ready or whatever. But the minute I sat down, we were talking about my family. Mm-hmm. We weren't talking about problems I was having so much at work. You know, we were, but we were tracing that back to the family system. So right from the get go, it's actually kind of funny because I, I, at, that's what I thought all therapy was at 20. <laughs> that you just go in and you talk about your childhood and the person is awesome and you start to do some work and you really have these huge changes. But I was really kind of heartbroken when I realized the rest of the field isn't really like that, especially when I worked in inpatient psychiatry and would sort of did my master's and went into like that world. So I my, my start in the what I do came from being a client years and years ago. But there's in the trend of the last 10 or 12 years about being trauma informed is, and it really is something that, to be honest, I'm not trying to, de- again, demonize therapists, but it's something that really kind of pisses me off to be blunt is when a therapist lists themselves as being trauma informed. But all that means is there's been a training that I feel, and forgive me if this is naive, about Being trauma-informed means that you don't press the client to talk about things they may not be prepared for, which I get, and all that kind of a thing. But there's also this kind of idea around it that it's just like you wait for the client to come in and talk talk about it. And then you sort of give them an educated conversation about if we're going to go there, about looking into sort of trauma. There's just such a, I don't know what I'm trying to say, it just feels like a little bit of a minefield that it's so eggshelly. But what the thing that really pisses me off about it is the general public cannot discern between trauma informed and having a trauma model or being trauma trained. So it's a little bit like sort of advertising, yes, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not saying all therapists kind of do this, like, yes, I'm trauma informed. But wouldn't you think that that means that the person knows how to like help you with an attachment wound? Let me. Do you know I, what I mean? I want to tell you two things. One, how empowering it is that you got great help on round one. 19 years old, you knew to get therapy, so wow. wise, and you had a great experience. As you know, mine was the exact opposite. Yep. 18 years old, walked into therapy, and truly for 13 years, lost so much time to bad therapy. It was a religious setting. Mm. No one was addressing the real things. And I was in this environment where nothing was getting resolved. And I had no idea that I was being re-traumatized in therapy. No, no, no idea. Mm -hmm. When we talk about trauma informed care, the number one thing that I think is missing is the awareness of someone to hold that space. Like I was saying earlier, just that piece of recognizing the way that this person is responding is showing hypervigilance, is showing dissociation, is showing showing something that there's something going on in their mind and body. You cannot do a checklist when someone is in that state. You have to engage, you have to be as present and grounded as possible. I Mm -hmm. asked one of my clients 
if I could share this story. And she said, I said, I'm doing a podcast with um, Patrick Tehan on bad therapy. And she said, yes, this definitely falls under the category of bad therapy. Mm -hmm. Tell them. So we had been working together for a while when I was still doing private coaching. And um, one of the things that I encouraged her is that she needed to go through a modality process with her therapist. And I, and I explained that that could be EMDR, somatic experience, somatic experiencing, IFS, like something where there is an actual process. My work is inner child work and a lot of guided breath work, the relationship with self, all of those things. But I felt she needed something extra. So her, her therapist was fumbling quite a bit and it never really asked her much about her story. And so when when she chose to finally tell her therapist, like, hey, we've been working together for four years, I feel like I should mention, and it was this list of so much trauma, so much childhood trauma. Wow. The therapist, from the outside looking back, was overwhelmed. This was someone that wanted to just dabble and stay on the surface, check someone off, make them, feel happy for an hour and then just not not go much deeper than that mm -hmm. so my client knew to say i need something more i need you to help me process some of this trauma yeah. and so she was explaining to her like anything like emdr or ifs or you know whatever whatever that thing is that helps the trauma start to be integrated in a way where i'm exhaling and i feel connected to my mind and body the mm -hmm. therapist went to a training on EMDR, a weekend training. And the next week, my client arrives and is talking about her week. And the therapist pulls out her binder, binder. and it's starts just... flipping through the binder and is explaining that she's getting ready to do EMDR on her. Oh, Luckily, no. my client mm -hmm. knew to say, I am feeling really uncomfortable with this approach. Maybe we try this another time. Right. That's another example of like if someone doesn't know how inappropriate that is. When when you are are dealing with trauma, childhood trauma, yeah. any type of trauma, there has to be a foundation. There has to be an understanding mm -hmm. of let's build enough of a connection where when you tell me scary things, when you leave this place, you feel safe. You feel like you had a container where you spoke openly about things that were quite scary for you, but somehow mm -hmm. when you left, you felt peace. Right. Going to a therapist and then going through a binder to practice a new modality that they learned. Yeah. That's not trauma informed care. Yeah. Relevant. I've had somebody, um, I believe it was a comment or maybe someone in my membership say they um they were with a therapist who didn't quite know a term and the therapist opened up their computer and kind of started looking it up you know what i mean and it was it was a very kind of basic kind of you know what i mean like they were just like oh dismissive avoidant attachment well, let me look that up you know what i mean and like yeah I'm, you know, it sounds like you have that you know it's like where are we and sure. on one hand you know, and in, in what the situation that you just described is, on one hand, I think maybe the therapist was trying, but that's not really, you know what I mean? Like that, I think a much more professional thing would have been referring the person to a specialist or trying to find them what they really kind of needed instead of banging out a weekend training. Because that just sounds, I don't even know how to get my head around that. And I'm not trying to demon, again, I'm not trying to demonize the person, but it's just like related to the field. Um, if I had had that person, if I was supervising that person and they came in and they said, you know what I mean? Oh, they want to do some trauma work. So I took a weekend training. I just would have sort of said, oh, I wouldn't do that with them. Because it's a little bit like, it's a bit like sort of like, this is going to be a bizarre analogy, <laughs> you know, like it's a bit like offering someone an easy bake oven when they've told you they want to go to culinary school, you know, <laughs> yeah. do you know what I mean? Like there's just something so, uh, you know, kind of about it. And um, 
the other the other piece too is that you know I like what you said about some people need a general talk therapist some people need to do some really good being in their body a little bit more or mindfulness work to be able to tolerate a relationship of getting into the intimate work of doing childhood trauma work with somebody and it, it's super intimate it's not it's not just sort of how you feel in this week do you know what I mean? For the ther a good therapist would like sort of know that, and I'm s trigger warning here, a good childhood trauma therapist is able to hold space for someone whose mother ignored that the stepfather was sexually abusing them, willfully ignored that, and not didn't do anything protective about it, just sort of shut it down, and then still requires the client to make nice with the stepfather at Thanksgiving and just wants bygones to be bygones. Do you know what I mean? You have to be somebody who needs to be able to hold space for that and connect with them. Um, and this may sound controversial, but w the model that I do is we connect with that person trying to be a new healthy parent for them in some way. So that's what I mean about it's intimate in a good enough way. That's someone that really cares for them, someone that really can see how their inner child is pretty wounded. How do we get their inner adult kind of in place? I do inner child work too. But also, how do we help that client have their kind of day in court emotionally? And to be able to really, to be honest, to be blunt, start to make it okay to get pissed off at a mom who did that. Absolutely. Instead of saying like, well, you were, like we started, can, oh, but can you see the love your mom has and the way that she just wants you to have a normal family experience? What, where are we? Right. You know, we're the in, 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 and that's really what it's like. That's really nine times out of 10, that's what probably your clients go through and my clients go through. And to sort of be sitting with someone that is sort of telling you to consider mom's feelings more, that she's just trying or, or something like that is really, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I think what I want to sort of say to the therapy world is just, just to sort of say, I think the therapy world needs to get out of denial that these families are really unsafe and to kind of wake up a bit and to realize that the human family system is still primitive and archaic not all of them but I think that the majority of them are put children in danger and don't know how to do feelings and whatever and there's lots going on with it I appreciate you saying that when you were telling the story about the, the mother wanting the holidays to go okay, that is the same thing. If that person goes to a therapist and the therapist then gives the feedback of where the mother may be coming from, that's what I mean where that person has no chance of navigating. I'm getting the same right. message where I am at fault for not adapting better to a situation that I would never choose to be in. My pain is intensified when I speak mm -hmm. about this and then the therapist is telling me that I should be somehow navigating this better when the reality is is that they should never be in that home. Right. There's, there, It's just amazing how these little slivers of conversation slide back in and always blame the survivor. There's just this constant... Isn't, it, isn't um, that a bitch? <laughs> it's just really something how... It's insidious, yeah. I, I see comments on social media a lot where when mm -hmm. I talk about estrangement and I will see the unhinged mother, I'm, I'm just talking about estrangement in general. I'm not saying the child who calls out their mother. I'm saying estrangement mm -hmm. and I'm talking about the dynamics. It never yeah. fails. There's the unhinged mother who comes in and says, well, what about my side? And then they explode and center themselves in this and they're surrounded by all these powerful comments and there's them who just cannot fathom that that their Absolutely. reality is is not being completely validated and it's just like mm -hmm. based on how you're responding it's right. clear that there's no room for your child there's no room for your adult child who's trying to heal to take yeah. up space in your your world you have no room for it that is mm -hmm. so many therapists that's so many therapists yeah. they do not have the capacity to understand right. how to hold space with other people's pain Right, and now the client who probably for the 20 years of development 
was erased in that family system. And by erased, I mean it doesn't matter that the stepfather sexually abused you. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they will get that message from siblings to the abuser to the, you know what I mean, just put it away, to grandma who's just kind of saying, do you know what I mean? Oh, let's not talk about that now. And a, a really good therapist, um, a really good colleague said that word to me, like, oh, they erased you. And it's just such a powerful word. Mm -hmm. So then when you get to that therapist and you sort of get the same message, you know, like, well, I wonder if your brother just wants normalcy. And that's why he's upset with you about why you won't come to Thanksgiving dinner. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's just like, it's like, our choices about going no contact has consequences. It is again to be erased. And what are the consequences of being erased is, I think people are wanting to talk about and get help around that sexual abuse so they can get a sense of self back. I don't think we can get a sense of self until we talk about the abuse that happened first. Meaning to feel like we, you know, when we say really say from like goodwill hunting, it wasn't your fault and that, that kind of stuff is the beginning of getting a sense of self. Do you know what I mean? Because when you've been that person who's been sexually abused and the family isn't real about it, is you're continuously being erased. So that's why it's imperative, I think, for therapists to not do that. Do you know what I mean? And I think that to be, I mean, this is where I'm going to get brutal here, is that I think therapists can't handle those conversations as people, as like there may be a character flaw. It's one thing. I think that they have their own codependency going on. But it's weird. I think that therapists need to be more brave because society is sort of saying, um, oh, do we have to talk about that? why don't you just put it away or even that's that's being generous do you know what I mean like or like in those comments that you mentioned I can't tell you how many comments of when someone is sharing I was sexually abused by my stepfather and my mother turned a blind eye and then a, a comment would be like oh boo hoo right you know what like, I mean? that was like, a long time ago you, that was a long time ago you ever been to a war you know what I mean like that kind of stuff and it's just that's what I mean about therapists trying, you know, they need to be more brave or they really need to be more kind of honest in the way that that's not the kind of work that they do. And, and I want to do a plug. This conversation is about bad therapy. We're both mm -hmm. aware that there are phenomenal therapists out there. Absolutely. But yeah. every single one of those phenomenal therapists has gone mm -hmm. through their own process of therapy. There is no great trauma informed therapist that has not faced parts of themselves that they were afraid of. There is right. no such thing. I asked you this a while back, and I think mm -hmm. it's important for people to hear, what prepared you to care for others more, doing your own work or becoming a therapist? <clears throat> Say that again, doing my own work or? What prepared you to care for others more, doing your own work or the training you got to become a therapist? Um, definitely doing my own work, but it's a funny question where this is going to maybe sound like either crazy or career suicide is I already knew what I wanted to do when I got my master's in social work and the master's in social work was just a vehicle to allow myself to do. I wasn't closed off to learning things. Some of it was cool and whatever, but I already had a model when I got there and that's the model that I experienced in therapy. So, you know what I mean? It was just kind of a, it was just something to kind of get the job done. And I think that though, that those getting a, getting a PsyD or a PhD or a master's, I think that those are all cool things, but it's all theory. It is all just sort of ideas and theory. And like you're saying, I think a really good therapist has done their own EMDR work with somebody or had a relationship with kind of a therapist. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think if you're seeing a therapist that just gets supervision from somebody and has never really done like any real intimate work, you know, or, and again, I'm not trying to demonize anybody or, you know, like we all get a master's degree in counseling or something like that. And we're really, really green. You know, you'll feel it from a green. There are just some people though that were born to be therapists. Do you know? And that's true too. Yeah. But I think that they are much better suited that they kind of have done their own work. 
I think that that's just an important part of the equation that's often dismissed is that anytime there's a power dynamic, a power differential created by a therapist, that is a huge red flag. I don't mean a therapist placing a, a, an appropriate boundary with their client that says, this is how this works. That's important Mm -hmm. and that's healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the client having a question or a concern and the therapist creating that power differential where they're saying, I will always have more power than you in this space, making it a balanced environment to be able to, to say, you are an equal here. You are paying me for a service. And while I have training and understanding about what you have Mm -hmm. experienced, this moment is your experience. Right. My job is to facilitate you finding clarity and peace. That power differential creates dependency from the client on the therapist that then later becomes a whole other issue that doesn't need to happen. Good way to put it. I just think that therapists can arrange kind of their vibe, and I'm sure many do, about not being the expert not kind of being sort of naming things or something like that and just kind of like I feel safer when I feel like I'm talking to someone um, and it doesn't feel like a doctor patient relationship as a guy I guess what I'm trying to say do you know what I mean like they can share a little bit that they can be human and whatever um, because it's just for childhood trauma survivors power and authority got so wrecked in, in fact, it, what makes people so anxious about going in to see somebody, you know, because there's just such shame there, you know? I think, I think that's, that's where we explain, because I I do um, have a lot of concern for so many survivors who are in a situation and they don't know that it's bad therapy. They don't know that they're losing time. Mm-hmm. What, what, do we, what do we tell them to look for? What do we say... This right. is an expectation that you should have. I, I want to start with empowerment, meaning that when you were in that space, you feel very much heard, validated, and there's a lot of clarity about the dynamic that's happening. And when mm-hmm. you leave that space, there's intention about yeah. what the next step is to create more peace and continue to evolve. That is a bare minimum. That may seem like this mm-hmm. big reach, but there should be a level of empowerment in that relationship. Yeah. Yes. And I, I love it. What I, and this was true for me as well, I don't know if it was true for you, when, when I hadn't really done any work and I was pretty feral, I didn't know that I could ask questions. Mm. I didn't, I just thought you just show up to the office and you hope to have your co-payment and you know what I mean? And you just kind of like, you get what you get (laughs) you don't get upset kind of a thing you know what i mean but i really tell people that when you get a therapist or a healer like on the phone or in the consult um some ideas that i have is just that you really spend time interviewing them and you really just kind of tell the truth in a way and you may not know this but it's just like if you're if you're drawn to these videos if you're drawn to the your instagram account my instagram account if you identify as having childhood trauma is I the first thing I would do is ask the therapist about um, how do they help somebody heal from an abusive family system and try you know don't be ashamed to kind of ask that do you know what I mean or do you know what I mean and just like where I think that the answer is you're looking for is that well when children don't grow up in safety do you know what I mean? And they become adults, you know, like I have this, this model or I do EMDR work about helping them change the belief systems. Then the second question that I would have is just sort of to say something like, um, and I'm just kind of, this is just off the top of my head of, um, or just to kind of say point blank, like I've been with other therapists that tend to maybe want to talk more about what my mom went through or my dad went through in his marriage rather than focusing on like what my siblings and I kind of went through or I need the latter, not the former. You can just kind of say point blank, like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And I know that's a tall order because again, 
this might be someone, might be the only person on your list that takes your insurance. Like there's other factors in the background that make these suggestions hard. This is also a good time to remind people, therapy is so important, it is so empowering. You can get 50% of what you need from your therapist, from that therapeutic one hour a week or whatever that looks like for you, and have a life that meets that other 50% where you have the result that you need. Let's be realistic, therapy is so out of reach for so many people that they have no access to therapy, but on their own, figure out ways to build a life. And I'm not in any way suggesting that this is easy or simple because it is complicated, but there are some powerhouse people that get on Reddit and social media and they get the information that they need and they go all out to do whatever they can. And it's so empowering to see that they, they are doing everything they can. My, my point is, is that, yeah, there is profound healing that can take place at the corner booth of a restaurant with your closest friend. There is profound healing that can take place on a nature walk listening to classical music. There is profound healing that can happen in your day-to-day life. It's you being treated in a way that you start to have curiosity and compassion about your mind and body. And looking at the memories, looking at the things that have impacted you the most, recognizing I've shaped my life around making sure this never happens again, yet I feel really heavy and I feel intense often. And it's starting to take those walls down and saying, how am I going to rebuild my life from from there? I just, I want, if therapy's a part of that process, that's wonderful, but it needs to be something that is empowering you to build a life outside of that therapy where you feel safe inside your mind and body. You feel like, I I know what my next step is. I know what to do this week to feel like a whole person. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I think, you know, I, I wish that, I really wish that therapy was more available and that it was more effective for what people are kind of looking for. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a lot of this stuff feels like we are having a, a specific medical issue and we're just seeing a general practice. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I just are not kind of getting our needs met. But um, there is just so much self-empowered things that people can kind of do. It's still kind of foreign to me because I didn't really do it that way. I just kind of hit the lottery and I just, you know what I mean? Like that was just sort of my story but there are incredible resources out there. There's really like a whole movement of people that can't get their needs met based from other helpers. And sometimes, you know, therapy isn't really the best thing for people. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it just doesn't really kind of work. So There's something so, about when I see someone make that statement, it feels very empowering to me. I, my, my therapeutic relationship would be so different if I didn't have such bad therapy in the beginning. It, it would mm. it would look different, but I hear people often say, um, and I'm saying this from a place I've been so dependent on therapy just for survival. Yeah. But when I yeah. see people say like, yeah, I tried different types of therapy and I realized it just wasn't for me. And then I found this and this really helped. That is so empowering to me. And I want Absolutely. to amplify that message to be able to say there's, I am a person that will most likely be in therapy for the rest of my life. That's just the reality of mm-hmm. how I live. I'm very much, a loner i live a very quiet life and that's a place where i can go process out loud and Mm -hmm. um know that i get a a significant need met but it's also like i want to amplify those messages i'm not saying that they're better um i'm saying it all matters and for someone to be able to say i tried therapy and it just really didn't click good for you to know that yeah and then to move towards the things that do right it's not the only game in town no you know, some people reach incredible things with holistic stuff, you know, or shamanic stuff. Or I know I'm 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 open to all of it. You know, I think that um, it's also just very empowering for people to sort of find their inner adults. It's just kind of the way I, you know, like they they find the ability to get themselves together in a in a good enough way. You know, I always sort of stress like what you're sort of saying about sort of a friend having a meal with a friend. And I think that really, you know, 
how we got here is because of abusive relationships. And I think profound healing comes from good relationships and finding those. So it's sort of, I say like self-healing is amazing. And, you know, for some people like just the therapy thing just doesn't work out. It's not the only game in town. But I do feel that people kind of need to, at some level, it can't all be done in a vacuum. Do you know what I mean? Like I benefit from my conversation with you so much, my friendship with you and connecting with you. And I think that that's, because I, I do see people sort of struggle make that connection either because of trauma or resources or taking a risk so join a membership join a group do you know what i mean in some ways and again our first group is our family i learned this from my mentor so it makes sense about how we have such an aversion to groups or connecting with other people but i find that that's where we get a sense of self back we kind of get connection back we get maybe some understanding back or it's not good I perpetually felt like I was coming from the land of misfit toys until I got into a group, you know? Mm -hmm. The land of misfit toys. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, let's plug our groups. Let's tell people about our groups. Yeah, tell me about your group. I have a monthly membership that I started in July from a course. I ran a four-week course called Healing the Younger You. And the feedback mm -hmm. from that course was, but I, I don't want this to end. I want to keep going. So in July, I launched my monthly membership where... It's really quite a beautiful space. We do uh, twice a month, we do a specific topic and I send them journaling prompts to process through that. And then several people submit questions, some anonymous, some are going to join me live. And then mm -hmm. every other Wednesday night, the first and third Wednesdays, I go through a, that specific topic and I teach for 30 minutes. And then we do live coaching with the people who have submitted their questions and they're able to get feedback from people in the chat box. And it's this um, really beautiful, yeah. I think the thing about that space is there is no therapist and I, I'm not deceived in believing that I am a therapist. I'm not, I'm, I have no interest in being a therapist, but I mm -hmm. love cultivating conversations around what it means to empower a survivor of abuse. And um, mm. it's, it's powerful, it's beautiful. Like I, it, just watching it grow has been really amazing, but I think it's just a place where people are starting to recognize there are other people who have felt alone and afraid and confused their whole right. lives. And now we're starting to see this is a shared mm -hmm. experience and yep. it's, it's great. Love it. And are you teaching inner child work through that? Are they, you know what I mean? Primary, I wrote my own version of what inner child work meant to me years ago in like a, a very dark period of my life. And who knew that years later I was going to leave my career start writing, share some of that online, and all of this would happen. It's There is a specific yeah. month in my life where all of this was planted, and now it's wow. all bloomed. And it's I have a picture of when I started creating these, these methods and these ideas, and um, it really helped mm -hmm. me to go through a very sacred process on my own of identifying what part of me is hurting? What is the message that they need me to hear? Not mm. not trying to speak to a past self and say, you just need to or you should, but instead take the back seat and ask them, what is it you need me to see? Mm -hmm. And starting to just blend that relationship and realize that these past selves carry very real pain and they're constantly trying to protect us and to be able to go to them and integrate them into our lives is having to see first why they wrestle with that. What's their reaction? And it also identifies like, listen, your six-year-old self does not like this particular friend and here's why. It just makes you very sober <laughs> and very aware when right. you start saying like, what, what is, is it that my mind and body is carrying? Why does, does, does this come about? about? So mm -hmm. I love teaching about inner child work. We talk a lot about estrangement, religious trauma, um, mm -hmm. kind of the, the taboo topics that just aren't going deep enough yet are such a large shared experience right uh two questions what's your favorite part of it and i would love to hear about the ebook that you wrote that you wrote about sort of the differences in types of therapies my favorite part of the group gosh there's so many we do um we share memes on friday which i absolutely love <laughs> people <laughs> save their memes all week um I would have to say that when someone enters the live call 
and they're mm -hmm. asking a question live and their voice is shaking and they're reading this thing Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's all very much curated where no one shares graphic information. I am very clear about the boundaries of like no one comes in and says this happened to me at six. Like it's very curated yeah. to where it's like, listen, it's just not realistic that we can be in an open space and talk about right. graphic things. So um, yep. but for someone, someone to come forward that, you know, they've never spoken openly and to be held with care and realize that their fear, that nervousness was, what if I'm the first person that Nate, Nate ever says to, yeah, I kind of think this was your fault. Or what, what, what if mm -hmm. the feedback that I get is, I think you should be handling that differently. That's a very real response because that's what that person's body has carried. Then yeah. they share and we engage and they receive compassion and a better understanding and we get to watch right. in real time that nervousness yeah. Yeah. dissolve and all of a yeah. sudden they're in their mind and body and it's safe that they yeah. spoke up and shared something that was really scary and they yeah. received what they needed. Um, that's probably my Beautiful. favorite part. Um, and then the I wrote an inner child journaling guide um, a few years ago and that's free to as many people who need it um, mm -hmm. for those who don't have access to therapy. Uh, the feedback that I've gotten has been very positive, but hopefully that helps. And then the other um, ebook that I wrote last year was A Survivor's Guide to Trauma Recovery, and that's also free. It um, has an enormous amount of resources for someone who's never been to therapy mm. to understand what to expect and to really feel empowered. Um, it's capped off at the end with tons of messages from other survivors to just say, "Wow, here, here was my experience, here's what you can consider. But it goes in depth into um, online forums, how to find affordable care. Um, it covers as much as I could possibly cover to really help someone say, okay, I have a mm -hmm. tool that helps me navigate making that first call. Wow. A couple of things. What you describe as someone kind of coming in with their trauma in their body when they're about to like what my mentor would say, tell the truth about talk about something or ask questions. Like I it made me think about you're doing like they're having an experiential where they're experiencing a new experience where they're also bringing up the trauma, but having it be received in a safe place is kind of like rewiring, having a new experience in that way. I love it. I love that you're doing that. And I love that you're doing sort of in a, in a place of a community because just hearing, it's really powerful to hear someone in, in a community say that they had a dad like that too, or they knew hiding in a closet or having like a lifetime coping strategy that they're still, it's a great equalizer because it just like, it just makes people feel that this stuff is, it's, it's horrifically common this stuff in, in, in abusive family systems, but it's very powerful because you can't bring up to a coworker that you hid in a closet or that you were the, the parentified child of five other kids and you would get beaten if you didn't sort of get things right, you know? Like that's huge, the service that you're providing. Where can people find your membership and the, the, e the ebook that you referenced? NateWrites.com. Okay. Because I'm a writer and that's just the e easiest way to go. You can find tons of resources there, the free ebooks. I just did a um, survival, surviving the holidays, a free webinar for people. That was, um, that was great. I try and do as much as I can to just Love get it. stuff out there that just says, if you don't have access to other things here, use these and let this <clears throat> guide you to the other thing. But I say one other thing real quick about like what you yeah, were just sure. saying that's so important. There is a, so many survivors have been dismissed, silenced, gaslit, scapegoated for so long that that turmoil is inside of them. And when all of the conversations around vulnerability came about years ago, I think the perception is telling my story and all the details is brave. And I would like to expand that conversation to say, mm -hmm. Telling all, all of the graphic, graphic details of your story in a public setting is quite traumatic. traumatic. It's traumatic right. for you and it's traumatic yes. for anyone else who is not prepared to hear what you're having to say. And what I'm right. teaching people 
is that you can come into a space and you can say something like, I'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask your question of where you need help. And no one doubts how bad your experience was. Right. When we are going and, and, and doing this thing that we think is vulnerability and just sharing all of this stuff, it is quite traumatic for other people. And people don't realize that it's quite traumatic for them too. They are doing something to their mind and body by exposing such a private part of life that I think that mm-hmm. inner child in us is begging and screaming, please stop telling the story. You're not mm-hmm. as connected to me as you think, and I am very uncomfortable with other people knowing this. And I don't think that a lot of people know that. A lot of people don't realize mm-hmm. I don't need to tell all of these details to be heard. That's one of the things that we practice in my space, and it's mm-hmm. teaching people you don't owe these details to anyone, and you are possibly going to re-traumatize yourself by doing that. This is for therapy. This is for a one-on-one conversation. This is with a close friend where you have an awareness of what the outcome could possibly be by sharing something so in-depth. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, it's, in a way, I could see maybe someone actually being triggered by those parameters or boundaries that you've had set up and I would sign off in them 100%. And uh, you know, the, those intimate details, it makes me think about there's a bunch of ways to tell the truth. The details are a way to tell the truth with a therapist as well as the just sort of saying in a summarized, I'm a, you know, I'm a adult child of an alcoholic and I went through sexual abuse and my question is or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's also kind of good enough, but I find that some people can get really kind of triggered to those rules or parameters, not realizing that they're for really for safety. Because okay, so if you, if you, you know, if you do, if you do talk about those things in a community of people that you don't really quite know, or it's in a public kind of setting, it's not in a small therapy room in a group therapy or individual therapy. Chances are you're going to go into a shame hole and get flooded after the call, if you disclose too much. So, yeah you wake up this vulnerable part of you that you're not connected right. to thinking Very true. this is what's going to get me the resolve that I need. And it actually traumatizes other people. They don't know what to say. They're mm-hmm. stunted by the details. And then everybody freezes. I, I, we just, we need to expand this conversation around vulnerability and start explaining yeah. what it and means and help people understand how to care for themselves. There might be some, a really good opportunity for like inner child reparenting. Cause I would sort of see it that I find that, inner children feel like if they don't give all the details, then they feel like they're not being honest or they're not going to be believed. Right. You know, and I, I I relate to that. That's how I used to, and I just share too much or I would get all anxious trying to explain to an authority figure what happened like a teacher or whatever. So I would just give way too much information, you know? So it's really, really great work you're doing. Really powerful. I will put, so again, the, the website is Nate writes, NateWrights.com, and that leads you to all my social media, and um, I can't do my last name because it's just too complicated, right? So I just do (laughs) NateWrights.com, and you can find the eBooks and the monthly membership there. But I also want to say a huge thank you because my monthly membership would not exist if it weren't for you. You you helped me through all of it and helped explain this is how you get it started, this is what you do. So a huge thanks, and Mm -hmm. talk about your group. Um, It's basically, you know, it's it's similar we just do we just so much overlap we're just doing such similar work inner child based live q and a's um your work and what you're providing and what i'm providing they are amazing they're not amazing replacements for therapy if you really need therapy but they're really good supplements they're really both of these you know communities are really good for people who are sort of frustrated with finding you know people people want answers people want guidance so in a similar way, I'm, I'm teaching inner child work in my mentor's model of RRP, coursework, connecting as a community. Um, and what I really love about it is they get to feel normal. I know that that's a loaded word, but they get to feel like it's normal to feel like you don't want to spend Thanksgiving with the stepfather who abused you when the rest of the world says that that's abnormal. So that's what I mean about like this great. And that's really what what I got 
from therapy. I started in individual therapy, but, I, but I've I've been in therapy groups my whole life with really good people, and it's kind of kind of rare, but you know, in, in a specific model. So I I really can't plug connection with a greater sense of community enough because you know I just wrote it in journal prompts yesterday about how how do you talk about your family with other people and giving the example of you you know you're you're at your job and your coworker says oh we just we live for Christmas you know what I mean I take the kids to my mom's place and all my siblings are there and we all hunker down and we do bonfires and it's just a whole thing and we live for the whole year like what are you doing Patrick you know what I mean if you asked me that question back in like the year of 1998 when I was going through like the worst of my therapy I would have been like Oh, I'm estranged from my family. I'm gonna to go to a coffee shop and, and chain smoke cigarettes and just read my self help books. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like but to have a community of people kind of saying like, Oh my god, I love this. I don't know how to talk to other people about my family. I either overshare or I don't you know what I mean, or I don't know who is safe to choose and all that stuff. I just I just love it. It's been incredible to see that this is accessible, you know, to be able to know that there, there is a place where you can plug in, even if you just are there to observe. Because I, I think that that's kind of beautiful too, that we both use the same mm -hmm. platform. We both use Circle. And I love that in that space, people can be completely anonymous and they're just there to observe and kind of take in what's around them and they're going through right. their own process. And that's, I just, I love being able to offer that. I love it. Right. Or if you've never gone to therapy or have been part of a group in some way and you've just been dealing with your trauma on your own your whole life in a very private way it's such a beautiful safe place to just get something going right you can still be part of you know what i mean you can still feel like you are resonating with people um and not sort of take such huge risk Agreed. if you're not ready to do that yet so I've loved this conversation. We should do this every week. <laughs> this should be like the, the Nate and Patrick podcast. Um, and you are my first guest. You have the honor of being my first guest on this thing. They've Amen. just been my YouTube videos and stuff or my own thoughts and stuff. So this is, um, I'm really excited to see how people resonate with this. And oh, lastly, yeah. um, to close out some final advice about how to find a good therapist, ask a lot of questions. There's a YouTube video that I did on finding a childhood trauma therapist. I even did some role plays about what it's like to be with therapists who are trying to shame you or take your parents' side or all that kind of jazz. Um, and I, I hope that this has been useful. And again, not trying to demonize any therapist. There's really great therapists out there, but let's we have to be honest that the field needs a lot of help and there are just are people who shouldn't really be doing it to be honest i know that sounds brutal and cold but the same would be true for the medical world you know agreed agreed thank you yeah. so much this was wonderful thank you we'll have you on again That's next week <laughs> <laughs> take care bye-bye